Alright. Okay. Um, Daniel's talk kind of led into this, talking about the maintainer model. Um, I'm going to talk about what the kernel uses. Um, for the past two years, I worked on a project that was um, for Android phone. I've talked about it before. But I, I learned a lot about dealing with modern, modern development tools and managing 120 some odd developers at the same time and what good tools are and, and good processes and how the kernel can deal with that or how the kernel can help influence that. So why does the kernel still use old email? Uh, it's really simple. There, my whole talk. Hold on. Um, there's some more reasons. Um, we, like John said, we had 4,000 developers last year, uh, 450 different companies, 200 new developers every kernel, uh, every kernel release. We must be so doing something right with all this stuff, right? Um, either we're getting really lucky or we're doing this the right way. Um, there's also another reason that turns out why we use email, and I'll wait till the very end. You guys might figure it out on the way. So John didn't talk about this, but this is our current rate of change. Um, I think this last release we may have broken eight changes an hour. Uh, every year I look at this number and I say there's no way we can possibly go faster, and every year we go faster. Um, it's crazy. This rate of change is very, very insane. No other project out there that I know of gets close to this. Um, it keeps going up. It keeps going up and up and up. And a lot of the people that are doing this work, last year we had 75 different maintainers who took over 364 patches. So 75 different people reviewed and accepted uh, one patch a day, 20, 24 hours a day, or every single day of the year. So you do a few more. That's a lot of maintainers. That's a lot of patch. Um, this is another fun number the past year. These are the numbers that these people review, accepted. Um, I say accepted, so I look at my numbers. I accept on a good day one-third of the patches sent to me. Um, earlier this morning, I reviewed 58 patches. I took 15, 13 of them. Um, that's the rate of acceptance. So the rate of people creating patches for Linux kernel is much, much larger than what you think. Um, Daniel, for being a board maintainer, you still do a lot of work. Um, this is the top 13 people. Uh, I think Arndt hit number 14. He did 998 patches. Um, but that's a lot of people. Well, that's a lot of patches. So um, I've given the talk to a lot of other um, projects. A lot of other projects hit a scaling wall where they can't accept patches fast enough that are being submitted to them. And so the kernel is looked at as a model of where this wall has been broken constantly, constantly, constantly. And I've been told, well, you guys are just really, really good. So how do we get people as good as you? And yeah, I mean, there's the old phrase, you know, poor craftsman blames his tools. But what it really means is you need to choose a good person knows how to pick good tools. A good person can do a lot of good things with some bad tools, as people who have used Garrett can attest to. <laughs> but if you know how to pick really good tools, that can help you out a lot more. So let's look at some tools. Let's look at a lot of tools. Uh, and Jeremy Bowers wrote a whole big little mini essay on this topic on Hacker News about three or four years ago. It's really good. The link's there. The slides are later. Um, they'll all be all online. So let's look at common tools out there. I'll lump some of these together. There's the public ones that a lot of people are used to. GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab. There's a few other public Git hosting ones out there. Out there. Um, these are good ones. So let's look at what they're good at. Um, GitHub is good. I mean, GitHub is really, really nice. It's very pretty. It's very, very pretty. Um, it's very easy to use for small projects. Uh, it's simple interface, it's obviously, these people iterate on this. GitHub is being doing a lot of work on iterating, making things better, making it nicer. Um, you get free hosting, unlimited bandwidth. Um, there's some people that use GitHub as a hosting service and the GitHub people just blindly accept it and they just serve up the bytes. Um, you can get drive-by patches really easy. Um, it's, you can tie in some testing hooks. You can integrate it into almost anything. And it's free. It's nice. And if you want it on your local infrastructure, you can pay for it. Um, it works out well. You can even pay for 
hosting private repos. I mean, it's a nice, pretty thing. People use it. I use it for the Linux USB utils. I got a drive-by patch about once every two months. I still have one outstanding. As you can see, there's still one pull request. It's nice. People are used to this. It works out well for small projects. <laughs> I'd argue small projects. Um, it's hard when you're a small project to know if you're ever going to become a big project, right? So here's a big project out there, the Kubernetes guy. Um, I talked to them a couple months ago, and I'm working with them. They're a Linux Foundation project now. Uh, pretty much Git, uh, Google donated the code and team. Um, GitHub doesn't scale for large projects, for large numbers of reviewers. Um, it's hard. You got, how many open requests do they have? They have 4,114 issues open. <laughs> um, they have 511 pull requests outstanding. That's really, really hard to manage. As a maintainer, you got to scroll through this web interface, pick and choose out of there. People try using tags. They try using labels. The Docker community tried splitting their repos up into different things and still doing tags. And Docker's gotten good by splitting things up. To now, I think, I look, they only had 150 outstanding pull requests. Um, and then there's communication. You can communicate on a pull request. You can have a thread, and it looks like email now. GitHub has duplicated email in a lot of ways. You can now copy an email list and have it back and forth. But the email discussion is usually different and distinct from your discussion for your general developer community. Because only the people who are assigned to that specific pull request see it. And that's important. Um, I'll talk about that a little more later. Um, issue tracking is pain. Uh, they've gotten better. It's getting better. Um, constant merge commits until two days ago. Now you can rebase onto head and go, and you can also squash things. So again, GitHub is getting better. Um, it also requires online access. Um, people think that a lot of people, everybody has good email and good internet access. Uh, that's not true. Um, we work with, the Linux kernel community works with a lot of people that don't have good email. Uh, a lot of people behind corporate firewalls. We work with people who can't use Git for legal reasons within their corporation. Um, that's a big issue. Um, things like that. Um, so GitHub prevents you from getting patches from those people. Prevents you from getting patches that can't access a web browser remotely well. Um, and reviewing it takes time. If you want to go and review 58 patches, you'd have to go and review and click and see the next one and a delay and the next one and the next one. I wouldn't have been able to do this during 15 minutes during Boris's talk. <laughs> I wouldn't, and then still pay attention to your talk. I could have gotten more, yes. <laughs> um, that's the bad part about GitHub. GitHub's not alone, all these other ones are like that. It doesn't scale, but again, small projects, great. Big projects, not good. So let's talk about another set of things. Um, there's some other tools out there, kind of like GitHub. Um, these are more towards corporations. Garrett is a popular one. Review Board is a popular one. Um, anybody know other other ones? There was a few more. I couldn't remember. I've used both of these. Um, so let's talk about these. I don't know any. <laughs> um, Garrett, uh, um, the one really, really good thing about this, and I've run into this a lot, project managers love Garrett. <laughs> project managers like Garrett because it gives them a sense that they know what's going on. A sense. <laughs> um, I have proven on a project I worked on recently that project managers actually don't pay attention to what's going on, and hence I had, seven, I had 85 outstanding patches that nobody was reviewing for a repo, and everybody thought everything was fine. Um, Garrett is rough. Um, sometimes you can script it. You can script some backends. Um, it's known a lot of people don't end up scripting it because those hooks aren't turned on. Um, but everybody has this. Everybody's used to Garrett because I guess it got in there from Google. Um, Google internally doesn't use Garrett. Uh, Google Android team does use Garrett. And I have a whole long list of things that they told me that they hate about it that I'm not allowed to repeat in public. Um, but Google internally does not use Garrett for its non-Android stuff. And that should tell you something. Um, what they do use internally doesn't work outside, but it's a really nice tool. So what are the bad things? Oh, I've already started with the bad things. Um, 
Patch submission is hard. It's hard to submit patches. Um, repo makes it a little bit easier. Um, it's still pretty opaque. And as somebody who's had to onboard a lot of new developers, it's just as difficult as trying to tell them how to submit a patch to email. Um, you want to do a patch series, you've got to create a special topic branch. And you got to make a topic branch, you have to make it so it doesn't merge, conflict with something else. Um, the biggest pet peeve, and this proves that whoever created Garrett does not actually do patch review. When you look at a patch that touches multiple files, you, have, you cannot see the whole patch at once. You have to click through every single file. Um, as anybody who's ever reviewed code, you just, that's just stupid. I mean, <laughs> give it to me all on one page. Even GitHub gets this right. Um, it's, it's a proof that it is not used by, not work with people who actually reviewed code. Um, a perfect example is we changed an API and some firmware, um, which touched 50 files. I had to click 50 times to make sure it was there. If I had just scanned it once, it would have been easy. Um, you have a long delay. In between each clicking one, you have a loop, a test uh, refresh loop. Even on a really fast internet connection, it's slow. Um, local testing is almost impossible with Garrett. Sometimes there's a little box somewhere you can click to download it all. If it's scriptable, sometimes you can suck the patches locally. Um, it will test on the back end sometimes. Uh, the project we ended up working with, uh, we had people who scripted the ability to scrape Garrett, suck patches down, run them through the continuous integrated, and then spit it back and send out a command back to Garrett. I mean, they were having to work around the tool that we were supposed to be using to help us work on a project. Um, and it takes a full-time admin, probably, at least. It's a hard to maintain. Um, I've talked to people who have set it up. Um, the instructions are online on how to set it up, and it's very good and detailed and instructive. It's long. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to maintain. I, I think of it as a clear case of the of the of this decade. Um, everybody has a, used to have a clear case system where you had a full time system administrator. That was their job, just to manage your clear case source code control tool. Garrett's replaced that. Uh, system ends like job security. Anybody else have any bad things to say or good things about Garrett? <laughs> Patch series are impossible. How can you, if you update a patch series, you get new number IDs, right? And some new versions and, uh, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Discussion is in a web interface that's separate from your development team. This forces your maintainers who are assigned to a project to do all the work. You do not get any drive-by reviews. Nobody on your team who isn't their job to do reviewing will ever review a Garrett patch. Do you know anybody who ever has? It, it, that's the well, and that's in GitHub is also that way. It's the problem. You have to do this. You have to go to an external site. You have to go and search for what you want to review. It doesn't come to you. The discussion's not there. And even on when you do review it and you do make comments on it, it's local between you and that developer only. The rest of your team doesn't see those comments. Sorry, I like ranting about this. It's been two years. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Um, plain text email. It's been around for forever since the internet. Um, there's RFCs about it. Um, it's what the kernel uses. It's what we use. Um, it's what we grew up on, a lot of us. What are the good things? Um, it's been around for forever. Uh, everybody has access to it, email. Um, there is almost nobody who doesn't have access. There is tons of free email hosting providers. Um, it works in any type of client. Here's Mutt. This is what I use. This was my to-do file but while I was writing this talk, and then I didn't want to write the talk, so I handled the to-do file. Um, but Mutt, very nice scripting. It shows you who responded to what. It gro groups patches together. You can cruise through them all. It's local. It's fast. Um, Non-native speakers works really well. You can automatically translate it. Tying that into a source code control system to translate um, text is very difficult. Um, accessibility. Accessibility, there's email clients for everything out there. Very good screen readers. The Linux kernel has a number of blind developers. A number of very, very good developers who happen to be blind. They work just fine with email. Scripting, accessibility issues on GitHub, it's getting better, but it's still there. It's very difficult. Um, fast. It is very fast. Um, local testing is easy. You can save it all, do local testing. Remote testing is possible. 
You can script email to do anything. Um, and you don't, and you can choose whatever client you want. Um, the kernel talks about how to do these. This is MUT, Pine, and Alpine are other good text ones. Um, this one's Evolution, uh, same mailbox. Uh, Kmail, Thunderbird, Claws, Sifield, TKRAT. People use TKRAT for the kernel. Um, it's weird. Everything's out there. Yeah. Emacs, Emacs, Kmail, <laughs> Vim. Did email mess up again? Or evolution make up, mess up again? Um, okay, well, one of the evolution primary developers is a kernel developer. We can go bash da David. Yeah, um, he'll go fix it. Yeah, it's, anyway, but, but it's, it's possible. Well, that's Debian Stables, probably. <laughs> um, there's lots of them. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I am not forgetting Gmail. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thunderbird worked. Actually, Thunder oh, I, Thunderbird was on my list. Did I not say Thunderbird? Oh, sorry. Um, Thunderbird, yes, does work. Actually, Thunderbird was discontinued by Mozilla, right? Isn't it a community project now? Um, anyway, um, one of the cons of um, email, um, a lot of clients suck uh, badly. Um, evolution and Outlook, or sorry, not Evolution, Out Exchange and Outlook, um, are known to corrupt patches. Exchange cannot take a text patch, go it through the server, and have it come out the other end uncorrupted. It is known for that. Um, every single big company has a Linux box in the corner to send kernel patches out. Microsoft does. Intel does. Uh, IBM does. To go around Lotus Notes. Uh, SUSE does not go through GroupWise anymore. <laughs> um, you tried to move to Exchange. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it didn't work. Um, there, Huawei is the only company out there in the world that I know of that actually gets Exchange to work. And I asked them how they did it. They said they have this magic special piece of paper with all the instructions and they're not allowed to give it out. <laughs> <laughs> but Huawei does use Exchange for email. Um, Microsoft tried. Um, it turned out that Microsoft has to run the internal uh, dog food uh, versions of uh, Exchange all the time. And it kept breaking things. So they just gave up on sending kernel patches that way. Um, a bad thing, project managers hate email. They feel and they see this interface because they're used to Gmail. Uh, don't use Gmail for patches. Uh, Gmail will work really good for discussion. Uh, I know a lot of people use it for seeing Linux kernel mailing list, pull it in. But here is some of the same patches. Um, you can't tell that Brian sent a threaded series. Um, there's another threaded series there. Um, you can't collapse patches very well because it, it determines based on the subject, not based on the threading. Um, don't use Gmail for uh, patches. You can, Gmail is very good as an email server, and I use MUT with Gmail just fine. Use it as an IMAP. As, I mean, Gmail is a good IMAP server. Huh? Linus uses Gmail for that, and then he switches to Pine, which is, uses um, the IMAP server, sucks Andrew Morton's patches down and applies them. Yeah, Gmail is great for search interface. So use a mailing list for, uh, subscribe a mailing list to it, and it works great. Um, Gmail does some cool things. You can subscribe a mailing list to it, have it always s sent into a s uh, folder, and then when you're CC'd, it drags the whole thread back to the main box and it sees it. Linus has, does that. I did that for a while on another project. It works really nicely that way. So Gmail uh, interaction, but again, it's an IMAP server, so you can run all your old tools with it. It works really well. So there, free email server interface that will work with kernel patches. Um, it's good. So... Um, we have talked about this. Chrome developers wrote a whole big how-to about this. Um, email clients.txt tells you how to set everything up, how to set the settings in Thunderbird and Evolution, if Evolution's broken. MUT, Pine, all those ones, how to do it right. 
Um, and it tells you how to do it. It tells you how to use Gmail. It says don't use the web interface. Use IMAP server. So, email clients. So let's talk about the kernel development process. I used to show this all the time. Um, what do we have? 4,000 developers on the bottom sending patches through email to the driver file maintainer. They review them on the mailing list. They say ACK, NACK. They say, is this good or bad? The subsystem maintainer takes that and puts it in a Git tree. And after it puts it in that public Git tree, then the continuous integration tools take off. The zero-day bot goes. The zero-day bot even runs on that mailing list, which is awesome, and finds problems. And then all the continuous integration stuff. Uh, Linux Next gets merged every day during the week. Um, Andrew Morton is sitting on the side pulling patches from email lists. Andrew Morton does not use Git. Andrew Morton does only email and Quilt. So and we don't require you to use Git for our project. Uh, and then during the merge window, we all tell Linus to pull different trees. Um, Andrew sends patches through email, and away you go. Um, works out good. This is how we do it. Zero day bot. Sorry. Okay, zero day bot is this giant, we don't know how many servers, um, system in China somewhere running by Intel that takes our Git trees and tests them. It, I do a push uh, within every 30 minutes, it'll tell me, saying, oh, thank you for those patches. This one broke in the middle of this 600 patch series, and here's a fix for it. <laughs> Which is scary on its own, because who owns a patch that a bot wrote? Um, but it's really good. It's really, really good. It, it runs all the Coconut scripts. It runs some performance analysis scripts. It runs security, static analysis tests. It does build tests on, I think within an hour, it gives me um, 70 or 80 different architecture builds. And then it continues to go after that and will do long ones and start doing bisections and whatnot. The Google Android team now uses it. <laughs> Because I get random emails saying your patch broke over here. I'm like, but I don't run the 3.14 kernel. Um, and it notifies the people whose patch it applied to. Zero, it, so it's how the Linux kernel has been doing a lot of continuous integration and testing over the past couple of years. They, they scan all mailing lists. Not just Linux kernel mailing lists. They scan individual developer mailing lists and they will give you an email saying this broke the build. If your patch breaks the build, and that's amazing, I love that because if I see that, I just don't even, I just ignore that patch series. <laughs> um, a very good advantage of having email as your client, um, and that's how we work. So this is how things work. So we work at, at an email on the bottom, Git in the middle, and up above. But some people only use email. Um, some people only use email because their company doesn't allow them to use Git. Like I mentioned, that is a very real thing. Some people use email because we travel and we don't have access to Git servers, or during the merge window, specific times, some maintainers will send me patches and some maintainers won't. Some people, some subsystem maintainers I don't trust, so I make them send me email, so I have to read the patches. Some ones I do trust, I implicitly trust, so much so that they're not gonna get it right, but that they'll be around to fix it when they get it wrong, and I'll just take their Git trees. Um, so depending on what the individual relationship is with the developer, the time of the week, or the review cycle, we can switch between email, which anybody in the world can use, or Git, which most of the people can use. We don't force a model on anybody. But we do it all in the open. Everybody sees everything that goes by. And Git is really, really good with email. I mean, when the kernel developers wrote Git, and we dealt with email, so Git apply mailbox, or AM, works really, really well. I mean, one key on my, on my and mutt, and boom, you apply a patch. So it's not much scripting, Daniel. <laughs> One key. <laughs> that's, my, that's my only script I have. I don't have any other scripts. Ben. I CD to my local repository for that tree and do that. Yes, I do. And we'll run it then. Um, or I will just pipe a whole mailbox. I save a mailbox, so here's USB patches, and I pipe a whole mailbox into Git AM. I do it outside my mailbox. Um, I'm kind of rare in that I have multiple trees. Most maintainers don't, they just have one tree. So it works differently. But yes, this works good. Um, this is being used by a number of the reviewers on the Outreachy project right now. Uh, one of them came, actually fixed my macro, it was wrong. And so she's using that to apply all patches to test them. It's really simple. So you don't have to be a um, 
maintainer to use this. So she does that, and then she applies them, sees if they actually apply, and then she can build and test it and see it that way. So anybody can use this. Works out well. Um, so Git and email work really, really well together. I, um, like you said, like Daniel said, it's like Git AM is this big, scary thing. It really isn't. It's a very simple tool. Um, but again, project managers don't like Git because they don't, and they don't like email because they can't see the status. They don't want to have to read through a whole thread of emails and say, oh, this is good. This has been applied. This hasn't been applied. And it's hard. And project managers run a project. They think they run the world, which they do for a project. But they don't, but you want to make things easy for the developers because you can have a project that has one project manager and 100 developers. Which one is the most important one? Well, both of them will argue they both are. But um, you need a project manager to be able to see what's going easily. So we have another tool that's out there called Patchwork. This is Patchwork, uh, written by the Oslabs guys at IBM. You subscribe a mailing list to it? Yeah. One thing I was going to say about the emails, don't forget that one of the criteria for the mail reader should be able to save a bunch of patches as a bunch of mail in an inbox, which I don't think you know. Can, uh, Gmail cannot save a bunch of patches as an inbox, yes. Right, that's hard. You're right. Um, Evolution can actually do that. Most everybody else command line one. So um, if you tie Gmail to an IMAP client, you're good that way. Yes. Git requires you to send them, save them locally. Um, patchwork. A lot of people don't know Patchwork's out there. Um, the, a lot of subsystems are using Patchwork now. Um, does DRM use Patchwork? Do, do they? Does, who use, I mean, what subsystems use patchwork besides network? I know the networking developers use it. Media? Video for Linux use it. Um, it's really good. If you look on there, you can see the patch. You can see the series. You can see if it's been reviewed. You can see what's left to do on it. You can see the status. You can see who it's assigned to, whether it has an app, whether it has a review button, whether it's tested. This is the thing that project managers love to see. They want to see this. This works off an email feed. You subscribe Patchwork to your mailing list, and boom, you get all this stuff. Some maintainers love this because they wait and they see the acts and the reviewed bys come by. Patchwork will spit out a mailbox with all the patches, with all the reviewed by and acts automatically applied to it. They can take that and apply it. That's how David Miller handles so many emails. It works out really well. ARM, does ARM use that for some subsystems? Some of them use it. Okay. It's really, really nice. It works really well. Um, the developers are very responsive. Um, they're hosting this stuff for free. There's patchwork.kernel.org, which is a little bit out of date. Um, it doesn't work so well. I couldn't, res I couldn't get my old password. <laughs> I think you're one rev back. I'm sorry. Um, but, but people, I think um, a lot of other, I think Linux PCI uses the patchwork.kernel.org. The wireless developers use that. Um, it works out really well. Um, it's a very, very nice tool. More people need to use this. Pardon me? There's a command, oh yes, there's a command line client to suck everything out and add it and um, you can't feed stuff into Patchwork that way, right? Just suck it out. You can change status and change Okay, you can change and delegate. Okay, all right, so it's very scriptable. I, didn't, I haven't used it that much. So, Patchwork is a solution for the people who are used to tracking things and want to see what's going on to combine with the rest of the people, uh, the developers who are used to mailing lists. Um, let's talk about Android. This is the development model for Android from Google's site. <laughs> this is how to get a patch accepted into Android. Um, there's, you can't really read the boxes. There's all fun things on how to make a patch, where to send it, how it gets integrated. Um, that one circle is all that uses Garrett. That's it. Everything else is something else. I worked on a project where we replaced that one circle with a mailing list, and it worked out fine. It can be done. That, is, that one little tiny box is not so integral to your project that it hobbles everybody else. Everything else outside there is something not reliant on Garrett. It can be done. Google implicitly actually acknowledges this. Replace one box and you still have a full Android development cycle. It really, really works. So why does email matter? Email, good. Again, simple. 
widest audience, scalable. And the last one, uh, the last one is um, the most important to me. It grows the community. You have a review, you have people coming on to a project, you need to let them learn how the project works. When you are a programmer, you learn how to program by writing code. You don't learn how to program by reading code. I think that's backwards. When you join a project, you should read the, read the reviews. Read what people critique. Read how other people respond to other developers. If you have a project in GitHub, if you have a project in Garrett, even Review Board, you have to go and hunt those out. It's not coming to you. It's not seeing everything come by. We had a project with 120 odd different developers. We onboarded new developers every other week. Getting those people involved in the project and learning how the community works, how your project's community work, would have been impossible if we told them go search Garrett for all the past review commits. All we had to do was say, wait a week, read the emails that go by. And it's that simple. They see the fact that, oh look, these people submit patches, this is wrong, this needs to be fixed, this is how you do things right, these are the common review projects our problems, this is how you integrate things. It's all public knowledge for your sub community. It works out really well. It's a way for you as a manager to grow your people to be better because you need that. You need your project to lead, to last. I want Linux to last. The way I learned, the very first email I ever sent to Linux kernel mailing list was how do I make a patch? And the, very, the person who responded was Wojtek Pavlik, who ended up being my boss many years later. He runs Sousa Labs. He said, here's how you do it. And now we have documentation that tells you how to do it. But it's a very common problem. You need to learn how to do these things and how to get involved. And by reading and listening to other people read things or what they write is how you learn. Rusty Russell said it the best. You want to get smarter, go hang out with smart people. You want to learn how to program better, look and see how smart people program. Watch how people write changes. Look at Al Vero's patches, <laughs> how he does things. Look at the network. Look at <laughs> Not his change logs, <laughs> not Alvira's change logs. But look at, uh, you want to see how a file system is developed and grows over time? Join the ButterFS file system mailing list. Join the ext4. You see the problems they have. You see the people reviewing it. You see people pointing out common problems that you don't really realize. If I'm a maintainer, I want other people to do it. There's people in this room that have echoed review comments I've made to different people just by the fact that they know how to review patches. That I, that I reviewed patches in a certain way and then they like, oh, that's a common problem. I can review that in the same manner. I never had to teach that person how to do that. They saw that and they grew on their own. You want that. You want your community to grow. Kubernetes, Kubernetes is realizing this. Kubernetes is changing. Docker realizes this. Docker is trying to change that way as well. You need that in order for your community to grow and be sustainable. You want other people to be able to join and learn easily. Oh, and the other reason we don't do it. We don't have project managers in the kernel. We don't have managers, despite what Constantine said. <laughs> the Linux Foundation manages people. <laughs> maintain. maintain, sorry, maintains. We don't need it because we don't have project managers that care when things are reviewed. But, like Daniel said, you do have people that care when their feature is accepted or when their patch is accepted. If you can look in patchwork and look and see, oh, look, I have an approved, I have an act, nobody's ever tested this, that's what I need to do next. It's very simple. You can see that and move on. You see the flow that as it goes by you. You don't have to learn and discover it buried in some GitHub tree. So, my final, final statement. Any tool can be picked. Pick a good tool. And email is still better than anything else we have out there. Like MUT. It's a horrible tool, but it's the best thing you got. <laughs> um, that's it. Thank you very much. Obligatory penguin picture, slides are online. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> yes, I know you do. Thank you.
touch has extraordinary resistance. And it's quite terrible that it's shown to you before you actually waste time. Yeah, we have it with the zero-day bot. It does it on the mailing list, like I said. It'll, it'll picture patches and says, oh, look, this broke. Yeah, Mozilla is one that's good. Um, WebKit also is another one. And LibreOffice. Actually, LibreOffice does everything in Bugzilla, I'm pretty sure. Um, Bugzilla is horrid, though. <laughs> um, it's bad. And it requires, again, you to be online all the time. And you have good web access. Um, again, so that cut out major continents. Yeah, I mean, that you're cutting off your development community right there. I, would have, I have a whole company of 350,000 developers that would not be able to access it. <laughs> Yeah, repo download, that get mirrors, yeah, that's the really issue. That's a totally different issue. Yeah. Ben, I think I wanted to say something. Uh you mentioned Zero Day Bot is closed source. The tests I, I I know the tests that they run are all open. Um I'm not looking at gift horse in the mouth right now. Um, right, other projects definitely can't do that. Um, but, so I, I will say, so the project I used, um, we had a whole bunch of continuous integration tests based on Android and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, you just push to the repo and then the tools would pick up and go from there. I mean, Git has hooks on the back end and away it goes. We would push to a test branch and away things went. So it can work out good. Well, they had a question. Uh, I totally agree with uh, what you said on CDR. I, I was already convinced and I, I had a recent discussion. <laughs> um, I would even summarize it uh, in a few words. Uh, in the development project, uh, code is fixed and we speak code only. And for me, it's natural that uh, we can uh, use the same channel for whatever communication between people and we just exchange code because it's part of the communication. Yes, so yeah, that's a good point. So the kernel, the kernel community, um, we don't show share design documents usually or talk about issues. We will speak with code that actually works. It's infamous for us to post patches saying, I haven't even compiled this. Maybe this works or not. Uh, Daniel, I'm not there. Okay. Right. Because if you do, if you use the same like some the tool, uh, source code of the type that you just changed, it will not the same. No, very fair. So yes, you need to send patches and diff and tool. Um, but if you look at Garrett and Review Board and Bugzilla, you're all sending patches through that. Yeah. It's. <laughs> yeah, because I think that non-technical people like like manager or project manager or something like that make when they talk. Yes. Yes, it is hard. Uh, and people, I mean, project managers and other managers, are, they can't handle an email work overflow that they have. I would argue don't use Gmail. I mean, Gmail does not handle an email overflow uh, overload very easily at all. It's hard. It's a hard tool to use. Um, there's lots of better tools for email. <laughs> um, 
push it. I convinced a project manager, a different project manager, to actually start using Thunderbird. That was personal success. <laughs> Yeah, it's fine. But I mean, good email skills is a, unfortunately, is a requirement of being a, in business these days. It's handle that work, handle the overflow, handle that. Gmail does, um, another thing Gmail does really nicely is filters. You can filter and stuff. I mean, everybody, nobody reads the whole Linux kernel mailing list. Uh, John does. <laughs> John and Andrew Morton are the only two people. All of us, myself included, filter. We all felt, I filter on things I'm interested in. Um, every two or three weeks, I'll go through and delete the 8,000 emails I haven't read and go on. Um, it's a huge overflow. You just have to filter and you have to learn how to filter. And things like that. But we have specific mailing, so the kernel breaks all its discussion up into tiny subsets. Of, so USB has a mailing list, storage has a mailing list, a specific file system has a mailing list, RDMA or Fenneban, there's a zillion networking. Even the networking mailing list is huge though. But um, that covers drivers and the networking stuff. So that's a, that's a tough one. I think I'm about out of time. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, what is the difference between a product manager and a kernel maintainer? Because I would suppose that the kernel maintainer <laughs> does not make the uh, uh, was uh, the same before. So, they want to know what uh, what's, uh, has been accepted, what has been uh, uh, reviewed, and all these things. And, and what is so a kernel maintainer's job is to make sure that the patches that flow through him for his subsystem work properly, right? A project manager's job is to make sure that they ship a product on time. It's a different, it, it, maybe it's the same idea. Maybe it's the same tasks. Maybe it's the same skill set. I, I can't argue that. Um, traditionally, a project manager does not, a technical, is not a technical person because they're not technically contributing. A kernel subsystem maintainer has the technical ability to reject things at a technical level. Oh yeah, but project managers don't know what's going on. <laughs> well, some, I mean, a lot of us have grown up with different tools. So Andrew Morton's tools are different than my tools and are different than Daniel's tools. I mean, different subsystems work differently because we have different people. We have... Um, an average of 160 different major subsystem maintainers. There's, nobody can agree on everything. Um, this lets you work the best with your way. Again, one of our subsystem maintainers is blind. His tools are different than ours. I mean, so it's the fact that we can work around different things. And some, sub, I mean, as some main subsystem maintainers are restricted by their employer on what they can and cannot use. So uh, that, that restricts them what they're allowed to use. Um, depending on where they are in the world as they travel. So, it, I mean, it, it's very, email is good in that it's flexible, it handles everything. We have one, um, one of our good security developers took uh, three months to take a bicycle trip across Africa. And he still sent us kernel patches along the way. <laughs> so, um, it works that way. I just wanted to say one thing, too. Is, uh, this is something I do. So one thing I want to know is when did Linus pull in my patches? I have a pull request to Linus and I want to know when he pulls it in. Uh, you can actually subscribe to, there's a way to subscribe to. Yes, there's a mailing list for git commits. Yeah, yeah git commits. This is, uh, every time we have a pull or a push to kernel.org, there's a mailing list that you can get every single commit. So I subscribe to that. I filter only on if I get uh, sign up by it. If sign up by my name on it, I get the email. <coughs> every time he just pushes up to it. So if you're curious, did my patch get in? This is a really a big deal all the way. Developer, you push in, and you can actually subscribe and see if your patch actually ever makes it to. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'm out of time.